Chapter 10. Nothing Lasts Forever. The truth was, even while the ONA show was successful, Opie and I had personally been treading water for years prior to the actual breakup in 2014 when I was fired from Sirius. What really caused waves between Opie and me was my divorce and subsequently my full-time girlfriend, who caused the divorce in the first place. He resented her, and it created friction between the two of us. She was basically the Yoko Ono in the whole situation. When we first teamed up, I was married and he wasn't. My wife and his girlfriend got along very well, and we used to do the double date bullshit. Movies, dinners, events, and the like. To say my divorce from Jennifer disrupted things between Opie and me would be an understatement. Opie liked the stable situation and didn't want anything to fuck it up. But of course, Johnny Fontaine comes along with his olive oil and guinea charm. I put a monkey wrench in the works by axing the wife and picking up this pretty wild fucking chick. Let me explain. I got married in 1991 after Jennifer and I had been dating for only a very short period of time. I was pushed into marrying her. She had her hooks in me and I couldn't say no. So I walked right up to the justice of the peace and said, I do, knowing full well I didn't. I didn't want to be married to this girl from the get-go, but how could I get out of it? I felt like when you sit on a roller coaster and they put that bar down and tell you to put your hands and feet in. I knew I was done. There's no getting off once it's clicking up the fucking track. I was on the ride, and it sucked. I hated it. On the very first night of our marriage, just a few hours after we exchanged our vows, I found myself in bed, lying on my back while she was next to me in what could be called an alcoholic coma. I felt a single tear roll down my cheek, and I, all I was thinking was, why the fuck did I do this? Our marriage lasted nine years. The only thing that kept me in it that long was that I found out early in the first year of marriage that my wife was part lesbo and wanted to do threesomes with hot chicks. Let me explain further. My band and I were doing a gig at a shithole on Long Island where my wife and a girl named Cindy worked. They were both bartenders. At some point after the gig, my wife came up to me and said, Cindy wants to come home with us and watch us fuck. Check. Check, please. I could not get out of the bar fast enough. At the time, I drove the company air conditioning and heating van everywhere because I didn't have my own. So I was driving drunk in the company van with my wife and this girl, Cindy, who was now sitting on my wife's lap. I wanted to do a thousand miles an hour, but I was thinking to myself, don't speed, don't get pulled over, I have to make this fantasy happen. Cindy was 24 and super hot. Kind of trashy, but I love white trash. Can't fucking beat trailer park trash with a halter top and shorts. So she and my wife started making out in the van and we finally got back to the house and had community shower time. It was as good as I could possibly dreamed. I woke up the next day and asked Jennifer if everything was okay. She was like, oh yeah. She said to me, some days I'm like 70% lesbian and other days 90%. Let's just say Cindy became a regular guest at the house until I got my radio gig in Boston. Now that I was on the radio, I was starting to get some attention from girls and Jennifer said, you ever think you'll be able to do stuff like that we did with Cindy again? In my head, I was like, yep. But with her, I truthfully tried playing it cool. I don't know. Would you ever be into that? I told her. Meanwhile, I got rock hard just thinking about it. Oddly enough, it never happened in Boston. We'd go back to New York to visit family and friends and end up fucking Cindy. When we got fired from Boston and ended up back in New York, I tried getting other girls and introducing them to Jennifer. Instead of her saying, hey, do you think we can do this? I was the one asking, hey, do you still want to do that? There was an instance with a girl named Melinda who came into the studio and got completely naked. She was dancing around and I was like, oh my fucking god, this is exactly my type of girl. Crazy, cute, pale, trashy, and just great. Have I mentioned that I love white trash? She was into me and I knew she wanted to do... something. I took that beautiful nugget of information back home and let the wife know. I finally met someone. So I set something up for us at this gig I had to do a huge Jersey Shore beach party. A very cool ONA event. She came with us and the entire time my mind was just on landing Melinda and Jennifer. I had to make this fantasy happen. I was just obsessed. I booked a room at the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan and we went there directly from Jersey and had a great sex romp. After that night I started developing feelings for her. She was a very cool chick and at this point I knew I hated my wife. 
We started having these threesome li liaisons regularly. Jennifer made it clear that there was never to be sex unless she was included. I said, well, of course, honey. We only fuck the same girl together. What am I, an animal? The, there are rules with cheating. This went on for about six months, with the three of us doing, doing it once a week. Melinda didn't like my wife. She just wanted to hang out and have sex with me. You can always tell if your marriage is being destroyed by a threesome if you're with the other girl and your lovemaking looks like a scene from from here to eternity. You're just rolling on the beach and having the most erotic lovemaking, but one hand is shoved out so your finger can diddle your wife at the same time. That's exactly what was happening. <laughs> Ironically, that's how Opie must have felt when Jim Norton and I were doing the show. Ooh. Toward the end of our relationship, Jennifer and I even started bringing Melinda out with Opie and his longtime girlfriend, Sandy Delgado. It wasn't an in-your-face, look-who's-with-us-now kind of thing, but it was enough that Sandy was starting to get very pissed off and disgusted. Sandy started telling my wife to try and put an end to it. It was this symbolic relationship with Team Opie, which included Sandy and Jennifer, conspiring to put an end to my relationship with Melinda. It was the circle of life, the balance of power all resting on everything being perfectly in sync. And the split second one of those Jenga, jogs, Jenga logs came out, the whole fucking thing came tumbling down. People were like, you fucked up your marriage for the, for the girl you had a threesome with? Hey, I ended up m with Melinda for nine years, which ended up being the most devoted monogamous relationship I've ever had with a girl I cheated on my wife with. Melinda was probably the only girl I can say I truly loved. And this relationship with Melinda was definitely the catalyst for the downfall of my relationship with Opie. Melinda lived in New York and would stop in to see me at the studio and Opie fucking hated it. It was almost like he would go out of his way not to say hello to her, which I took as an insult. Opie wanted to confront me about this and talk about it, but he wasn't going to do it unless I brought it up. We were the worst po possible combination of conflicted people. I don't give a shit if there's bubbling lava around me as long as what I'm standing in isn't lava. I'm fine. Oh, the lava's approaching? It's going to burn me at some point? I don't care. Right now, I'm great. Not a problem in the world. I was too much of a pacifist about the whole thing. Until we had our first on-air argument. No one ever knew we had any problems. We could turn the microphones on and people would envy how we sounded together. They would never know that the minute the mics weren't on, we could be at each other's throats. I remember times off air when we'd be dispensing mutual fuck yous and one second later starting the show like nothing ever happened. We were both pros. That said, the stress and pressure of this animosity we had was insane and weighed heavily on us, but I was making more coin than I'd ever dreamed of and wasn't going to fuck that up. Always the show first. Opie knew I was fucking around. The rule Jennifer and I had about not fucking anyone without each other went out the window. Melinda would come over to our house in Huntington and spend the weekend. We'd hang out and go to dinners and movies, drink, and then fuck at home. My wife would get up in the morning and be like, Okay, I'm going to take a shower. The second that bathroom door shut, I couldn't be on top of that girl fast enough to bang her without having to diddle my wife on the sidelines. It was so hot. And then she'd come out of the shower and we'd have to pretend we were watching television. Oh, hey, you're back. Then my wife got a bug up her ass thinking that if we had kids, everything would be okay. She made a concerned, concerted effort to get pregnant, and I was like, no fucking way. But again, I'm a diplomat and didn't want to get into a heated argument, so I'd be fucking her and pretending I was coming. I'd put on the, I'm coming face, thrust, and make the orgasm appear legitimate. Then I'd go into the bathroom and jerk off. I was so convincing, and it got so bad that she made us go to a fer fertility clinic. The doctor said, you two are extremely fertile. I can't quite understand why this would be happening. Why? Because I was jerking off into the toilet. Opie was hearing it every night from Sandy about what a piece of shit I was. I know he didn't want to get involved. No guy wants to hear about his friend having a threesome in a negative way, especially from his girlfriend. After a while, it just pissed Opie off. At this point, I wanted nothing to do with my wife anymore. After a while, my wife could tell what was up and wanted to put an end to it, and gave me an ultimatum. It was my best chance to just say, Okay, bye. And that's what I did. Fortunately, we divorced when I was making only $145,000 with WNEW, which at the time was unfucking believable money. A couple of years before, I had been making $28,000 knocking tin with an air conditioning company. 
This was right before we signed the next deal, which was a which was ludicrous money. A tipping point was a softball game at Bear Stadium in Newark, New Jersey. It was a great O and A event with a packed stadium of eight thousand people. Celebrity players like Jay Moore, who was huge at the time, and Tracy Morgan were there with us. We had strippers behind home plate in a kiddie pool. It was just a debaucherously great fucking time. So my girlfriend, my girlfriend's sister, and her husband show up, and I wanted to have them carte blanche all-access VIP passes that include the dugout and locker room. Rick Delgado was our executive producer of the show and brother of Opie's girlfriend, Sandy. Rick came up to me and said, I'm sorry, but they can't come in. I was like, you're fucking shitting me, right? Rick wasn't joking. Opie just wants show people and the players in this area. I knew this was a direct jab at me and Melinda. This was beyond ridiculous. I could bring in whoever I, whoever I wanted. If I wanted to get strangers from the stands and bring them into the dugout, I could. I confronted Opie and said, this is bullshit. We had a little discussion. It wasn't a heated argument, but it wasn't very pleasant. He pulled an, oh no, they're, they're, not, they're allowed down here. I told him that there was no way Rick would ever tell me I couldn't bring someone anywhere unless he had been specifically told to do so by Opie. This was an example of Opie saying, I'm not your boss, but I'm your boss. The animosity was just escalating. Occasionally, we did talk about it. There was a time I was in Philly at my hotel and Melinda was just bawling her eyes out saying, he fucking hates me, he doesn't say hi, never introduces me to anyone and just ignores me. Now I had to do something. She was crying in my hotel room for Christ's sake. I took that opportunity to approach him and said, look, you need to change your attitude towards Melinda. This isn't just the girl that busted up my marriage. I truly care about her. And if you're completely disrespecting her and through me, through that and through that me by acting like this okay he apologized and acknowledged it was hard to deal with this situation that was the typical example of how he would put something off a little bit longer after that for a couple of weeks things would be great i then realized there was a constant problem of there always being something our job is quite possibly the easiest one you could have I command you to go into that room and talk with your friends, laugh, and don't come out for three or four hours. Wow, what a tough gig. If you work for a living and you've been on a rooftop in August or in in an attic in July, you know what work really is. And to work in a studio and make jokes for a living is not fucking work. Some people don't know that working class life, and I don't think Opie did. That was another part of our personalities that just didn't click. Chapter 11 the voyeur bus on november 30th 2000 our show on wnew caught wind of a voyeur bus that was driving around manhattan letting women have the right to show their tits in public without being arrested we got in touch with this company and had them come down to our show to interview them it was a half dozen girls and the guy who ran the business and the driver it was a greyhound style bus that had been converted into a makeshift motorhome the sides were clear glass so anyone could easily see into the bus Inside was a shower, bedroom, living room, workout facility, and of course a pole. This company featured nude or semi-nude models who could be followed on their nationwide bus tour via a paid website. We knew this was right up our alley and something we wanted to get our names attached to for the great press. During the interview, we asked if <clears throat> during the interview we asked if we can send a few of the girls that were with us and some of the guys from our show to join them during their drive around the city. It was decided that it would be Jim Norton Louis Black, executive producer Rick Delgado, head of production Steve Carlisi, and the girls we had from the Best Tit Contest. Psycho Mark jumped in later during the ride. We all joined the girls who were already part of the bus crew. We did remote breaks with our guys calling in to tell us what the people outside were doing. The remotes were fantastic. We traveled right down Broadway and through the heart of Times Square. ABC was showing David Blaine in a block of ice stunt he was doing, and he actually waved to the naked girls as they passed by. MTV had to change its camera angles because they were doing MTV Total Request Live with Carson Daly, and he was caught checking out the girls. There were families on vacations, and here was the bus, this bus with topless broads driving right by them for everyone to see. It became a real spectacle, and we were the ones orchestrating it. The NYPD officers were such good friends with the show, they decided to give the bus an official police escort. 
They had two cop cars in front of the bus clearing the way so it could continue its route. This whole thing turned into a big news very quickly. We got a call from CNN correspondent Jeannie Moose, who asked if we could pick her up with a film crew. She said it sounded like it could be a fun segment for them to air. Hell yes! We, obl- obl- we obliged and picked them up prior to one of our stops at City Hall. We had no idea what her real intentions were, which was to lambast this whole thing. When we got to City Hall, Jeannie Moose said she had, that she had all she needed and asked to be let out. That sneaky bitch went right into Mayor Giuliani's office to share with him the footage and rat us out. Meanwhile, the bus was headed up 6th Avenue back to our studio and the police escort all of a sudden disappeared. There wasn't any traffic on the street at all. The bus was just moving along, making all the lights, and out of nowhere from everywhere came every type of law enforcement vehicle you could think it existed. There were state police, NYPD, and black cars with no identification on them turning in front of the bus, stopping and pulling it over. Cops got out and dragged everyone off the bus immediately. The girls were able to put shirts on. They wound up arresting everyone on the bus. Poor Louis Black, a political comedian, he had thought it would be fun to take a ride on the bus with some naked chicks and was sent along with everyone else down to the Tombs Correction Facility. Things happen. What we had failed to realize was that President Clinton was coming into New York City around that very time. He had already landed at Kennedy Kennedy Airport and this part of 6th Avenue had been blocked off for his arriving motorcade. The voyeur bus, of all things, decided to make a turn onto 6th Avenue and continued up until it was stopped. The irony is that President Clinton would have gotten a kick out of a bus full of nude women. I could see him saying, I really like this New York City welcome. (laughs) That we had to go through the legal channels trying to get Jimmy, Lewis, Rick, Steve, and Psycho Mark out of jail. Mayor Giuliani did not like this at all. There was a press conference and a reporter asked him, What's your take on this voyeur bus, Opie and Anthony thing? Stupid. Just stupid. Which is another great quote I have from a man in a powerful position about our program. I would assume it came from the top that, regardless of what you find or don't find, hold these motherfuckers for at least 24 hours. Just hold them and don't let them out. We couldn't find any lawyers, lawyer to get these guys out of there either. They were like, what are they charged with? Well, we're still working on it and compiling charges. All the men were placed together in a holding cell. The same with the women. After 12 hours, the guys were put into the general pop. They were now surrounded by hardcore criminals who would beat the shit out of you if you looked at them the wrong way. It said that Jim Norton fit in like he had been cast for it, twitching and talking to himself nonstop. No one ever considered fucking with him. Poor Louis Black didn't come back on our show for quite a while. When all that was said and done, 28 hours later, no charges had been filed. They went in front of the judge and he was pissed he even had to waste his time with such nonsense and release them immediately. We were again just millimeters away from being fired for that one. On days like that, you're either fired or they're putting you back on and loving you because the ratings are huge. The new book would come out and we'd love, we'd be on the very top. This only made us look for something else to put to top ourselves. Maybe sex in a church, maybe sex in the biggest Catholic church in New York City. Or arguably the whole country. Yeah. Chapter 12. Syndicated and Vindicated. In 2001, our three-year contract with WNEW was ending, and we started renegotiating a new deal. Clear Channel Communications came in with another offer for us to have our own morning show on Q1043 to go up against Howard Stern. Whether we beat Howard Stern or not was inconsequential. CBS knew that we could potentially take enough listeners away to keep him from being number one. This made us a commodity to CBS, and they did not want us to leave. Howard's number one status in mornings made them billions of dollars. Howard needed to remain on top, or they would lose a boatload of money. And there was a very good chance he would not be number one if we went against him. That was all the math they needed to say. Write these fucks a giant check and give them what they want. We wanted syndication. We, of course, wanted to be back on the air in Boston. We had gotten thrown out of there and knew it would be legendary to come back on the airwaves. This was our General MacArthur in the Philippines moment. I shall return. We ended up in 18 cities. Washington, D.C., or Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New Orleans, and Houston, to name a few. 
We played predominantly in East Coast cities because of the time delay and are starting at 3 p.m., which would be noon on the West Coast. When we made the syndication deal, it was one of the most surreal moments I've ever experienced. Our agent, Bob Eatman, had a room in the Parker Meridian Hotel in Manhattan and was fielding calls. Opie and I sat in the hotel room listening to his back and forth with Infinity Broadcasting slash CBS, discussing the, discuss, discussing the cities we would be broadcasting in and the money amounts to go with it. We were getting a three-year contract and each city had an annual salary. There would be bonuses according to ratings. The potential for money was amazing and the actual money was ludicrous in the very best way. I was listening to Bob say these exorbitantly large numbers for our salaries and was looking at Opie like, this can't be real. Did he just really say that amount? We were entering into the realm of fuck you money. Opie and I were just pacing and nervously laughing at times. Bob was repeating out loud the numbers that they were offering us so we could hear, and it was millions of dollars. Here, I was a full-fledged shock jock, and I was the one being shocked, hearing these massive amounts of money being offered to us. I was numb. It was like one of those out-of-body experiences you hear about when someone gets close to dying and is floating outside their own body. Was I dreaming? Was I going to wake up at any moment and be like, fuck, I knew it was too good to be true? I was, wa I was waiting for the building to collapse or something to mess this up. It was like having the hottest girl in the world come over to you and ask, ask you to take her home, and she really ends up fucking you. I couldn't believe I was going to be a multi-millionaire for doing something that was so much fun and easy to do. This was my dream coming true. Bob got off the phone and ran through year one, year two, year three, all the cities our syndication deal came with, and the bonuses. There was no question of not signing this deal with CBS Clear Channel just didn't have the number of stations and couldn't match the money. Clear Channel wanted us, but CBS wanted us more. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. We had a lot of crossover fans from Howard in the morning who listened to us in the afternoon. There were also a lot of dedicated fans in both camps who hated the other side. Even though we worked for the same company and our shows were on at different times, Howard saw us as competitors. He would reference us as my clones across the street. Hoo hoo. Howard knew we weren't just a couple of jocks when he like he could squish like he did so many others throughout the years. We didn't take shit and we certainly didn't listen to our PD or GM on how we would, should handle Howard. We knew how to handle him. I had listened to him my whole life and knew exactly how to make people laugh at him. You can't just come into New York and say Howard sucks. The people would go, what? No, he doesn't. He's great. I fucking love him. We knew we can get away with doing impressions of him. Then people would be like, holy shit, that's funny. I was goofing on shit about Howard that I had known for years. And if someone heard that, they were like, fuck yeah, he really does do that. Howard always wanted his audience to see him as a regular guy. We would push it a funny way telling people he was a Hamptons guy, part of the elite, and it chipped away at him. We kept doing that and he knew it was, a, he knew it was effective and he hated it. Then he would retort by bashing us. And it wouldn't work because we were unconventional. We always found out when he was talking about us, and I'm positive he heard what we said too. I don't know if Howard had any respect for me or our show or any show other than his own. I have respect for him. He really was the first successful shock jock. There were other jocks before him who were kind of doing something. Howard was the one who wrapped it all up in a great package. One jock might have done bits, another was great at interviews, and one was a little in ir irrelevant irreverent. Howard was able to put it all together seamlessly while surrounding himself with amazingly talented people. He became successful at the perfect time in the 80s and 90s when radio was still king in your car and there weren't as many options. If you wanted something risque or edgy, you listened to Howard Stern. Opie and I came in at the tail end of the shock jock thing. I think we're partially responsible for blowing up the whole genre as far as making headlines because of our outrageous antics. We actually got into trouble intentionally because of Howard Stern. Oh, sorry, internally because of Howard Stern. We became privy to some personal knowledge about Howard. He had a particular family situation of a very private nature. We alluded to it on the air in a very ambiguous way, and it got back to him. He was quite upset. This was literally right when we went on break for Christmas vacation. We got a call from Mer Mel Carmazan's office to meet him at the Black Rock building in Midtown. We knew this wasn't a good thing. We had to wait in his lobby for at least an hour. I'm sure Mel told his secretary to let us sit there for a fucking hour. When we finally walked into his office, he asked us, 
What time do you wake up and decide you're going to fuck Mel Carmiston? <laughs> Holy fuck. I was sitting there thinking, this is one of those questions there's no answer for, is there? You don't give him a time. It's not even a question about if you're going to fuck Mel Carmiston. You've already fucked him. He just wants to know when you woke up and decided you were going to do it. He said, how does it do my company any good if my afternoon show is fucking my morning show? Should I go to my stockholders and tell them whatever you tell me about how it does the company good that you're all you're fucking my morning show? You will never be smaller in a seat than when you're getting lambasted by Mel Carmazan. I was probably 40 at that time, and I was getting yelled at by an adult. <laughs> it brought me right back to when I was a kid getting yelled at by either my dad or a principal. I was waiting for him to call me pissy eyes. The truth of the matter is that he had us dead to rights, and we had nothing to say. The whole time I was just hoping not to hear, You're fired! You're fired! And we didn't. I think we skated out of that one by a pube. Before we left, Mel gave us a stern warning letter to let us know we were never to speak of Howard again. We walked out of there and let out a huge sigh. We felt this relief that had made it out alive and been given another day. Then, of course, by the time we were a block away, we were like, Fuck Stir and that fucking asshole. I had this pressure like a piano hanging by a thread over my head. Every fucking day. I just had to figure out how to tap dance to satisfy an audience and our bosses. I hoped this wasn't going to be the day the string would break and I'd get crushed. This was a constant thought. I felt this obligation to be better and bigger every show. I wanted to do better and make and be more outrageous every time, with the ratings constantly going up. I wasn't even thinking about the financial bonuses. I just wanted to be able to say we had the best show and a fuckload of listeners loved, loving it. To do this on a daily basis was pretty stressful. I was really balancing my entire job on keep entire job on keeping my job. It was a very topsy it was very topsy turvy because if you're fired, that's it. Good luck on your next gig, maybe. Or, or it would be, oh my god, that was great, you're the best thing ever. It's a fine line between those two things. We did that for so long and it was exhausting. In 2001, Vince McMahon and the WWF joined NBC to put together a professional football league called the XFL. It lasted one season and games took place during the NFL's offseason. It was the extreme football league with fewer rules and more violence. One of the sports execs from NBC was tasked with the job of finding a pregame show for this new football league. Every football game has a pregame show, and that gets the viewers psyched up for the game they're about to see. NBC needed a couple of guys who could fill up the restaurants in the WWE had or fill up the restaurant the WWF had in Times Square. It was a huge place with a big stage. They were going to be having XFL cheerleaders and players. They needed this place to be full and had to get a host who could draw a crowd in New York City. Well, what about those guys, Opie and Anthony? They could do it. Yes, but they do know they do they know anything about our television or hosting a pregame show? Do they even know anything about football? Fuck it. Who cares? As long as they can fill the place up. That's my interpretation of what happened at 30 Rock. Bob Eatman got approached and called us and said the XFL, which is this new pro fo football league, wants you both to host their pregame show. Opie and I immediately went, No, that's not us. We're not those guys. Oh, okay, I'll tell them. Bob came back again saying, All right, here's their new offer. They really want you guys to do this. And again, we refused. The third time they came back with so much money, there wasn't any reason we weren't going to do this. They wanted us to commit to one season which would be 13 hour-long episodes, and it was just hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was a lot of money, so finally we were like, yeah, fuck it, let's do this pregame show. Totally for the money. We told them we had a radio show that was our priority, and we didn't have the time to come up with an hour-long show each week. You guys have the writers at NBC, so you'll have to be responsible for that end of it. Fair enough, right? You tell us what we need to do, and we'll do it. They say no problem, and we signed the contract. Done deal. We were now the hosts of the national weekly pregame show for the XFL. Day one, the first show, we made our way to the WWF restaurant. They were like, all right, what are we doing? We were like, we don't know. We were planning on you telling us. 
Well, we don't have the cheerleaders dancing over here, and Bruce Beck is going to be our NBC sports correspondent that you'll be throwing something to someone, something to sometime during the hour. In between, you got any bits? Bits? See, now Opie and I are expected to come up with this shit every week to fill in time between the dancing cheerleaders and Bruce Beck doing analysis. I was in the kitchen of the cafe thinking, what am I going to do? I was working on dick jokes for a national TV an hour before we were fucking going to tape. We received no support from NBC and we knew at stake. We were up on stage with the cheerleaders and almost dancing. We were like, we'll be right back. And we were standing with the, cheer- with the dancing cheerleaders and it was so awkward. These people who filled the Vacus Va- restaurant were all ONA fans. They didn't know or give a shit about the XFL, and they just wanted to be entertained. They also wanted to entertain us in return. Their mindset was that they were part of the show. They were, there were three cameras filming the show, and there were two guys in front of the stage. They decided they were going to get in on our camera shot with their hands and pretend to be jerking off over me and me as we were talking. Oh, shit. They were doing this the whole time we were on stage, and no one caught it till editing. They couldn't use one wide shot for the entire segment. They wanted an audience, and we provided them with one. We didn't promise anything about quality work. We had a female announcer introduce us on the show, and now, Opie and Anthony, you'd hear the audience chanting, Show your tits! The sound would get picked up, and we'd have to cut and do it again. They'd come to the dressing room and go, Um, guys, is there any way you can get your audience to stop saying, Show your tits? I said... If we go out there and tell them to stop it, it's going to be twice as loud. You don't understand. We can't control these things. Mercifully, after four episodes, the whole XFL thing was scrapped. That was it for the pregame show. They did have to pay us out for the whole contract, and I feel we earned every cent of it. XFL was the second biggest disaster of 2001, and not by much.